Welcome to my home in Dubai. I call this the remarkable women of the Middle East. There is no one I can think of uh, today than my dear, dear friend, uh, Rahaf Raif. There was a time in my life where I just took off the hat of delicacy so I could wear another hat. Rahaf, come on, you worry too much. Maybe he just forgot to charge his phone. Three hours later, I receive a call that your Allah Yirhamu, he died. You know that feeling when you just want to take revenge from something or someone, but you just don't know what or how? So I just went above and beyond to sabotage myself. The expectation that uh, is thrown on men to just zip it and keep going. Please don't zip it. Oh, so many people will get upset. <laughs> Today, I would say I am grateful that my dad ended up dying by suicide. Wow. Welcome back and welcome to my home in Dubai. I have recently been uh, instructed by the Lords of Travel to stay put. So I haven't traveled actually for a month and a half, uh, multiple reasons. And uh, as a result, I decided that's actually great news. I'm going to have a series of podcasts uh, that are focused here on the Middle East. So uh, I call this the remarkable women of the Middle East. I totally believe that you will be blown away uh, by the guests I have uh, lined up for you. So uh, what is remarkable? Remarkable, in my view, is not about someone who has gone far in life, you know, someone who has achieved something big or had a big impact. Only it's more about uh, how far that journey was, where did we start, what the challenges that we faced on the way uh, are. And uh, there is no one I can think of uh, today that can give you an example of that, uh, of how far she's come from a very difficult beginning uh, than my dear, dear friend, uh, Rahaf Raif. Uh, Rahaf, as she calls herself, is a fun-sized, petite woman uh, who uh, stands quite big with a very big personality in front of CEOs and corporate clients in the Middle East to teach them not only about success and productivity, uh, but also about connecting to one self and finding yourself in a way that allows you to offer love and kindness to your loved ones and have a full life rather than just a rich life if you want. Uh, she coaches CEOs directly and she also reaches out or welcomes women who find it difficult sometimes because of the conditioning of the Middle East to live fully truly to themselves if you want massive, massive impact on uh, on the world that we live here in the Middle East. Uh, but more importantly, uh, massive impact that is unlikely, as I said, because of where Rahaf came from. So uh, allow me to introduce you to my uh, dear friend, uh, Rahaf Raif. Hi. Hello, Hello. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, So uh, Rahaf, I want to start from uh, your name, actually. Rahaf, yes. Rahaf Raif Abaisi. Yeah, Rahaf is in Arabic, uh, comes from Rahafa, which uh, the verb... Delicate, Murhaf. Yeah, de delicate, exactly. Uh, fragile, sensitive, skinny sometimes. It's not... Really? Yeah, so Rahaifa. Okay. Right? I did not uh, know that. Yes. So basically, the it's, it is it is not being delicate. It's delicacy itself. Yes. Right? So Rahaf is that. Do, do you believe you are? I am. Rahaf? I am. I am delicate. There was a time in my life where I just took off the hat of delicacy so I could wear another hat. It could be resilient, strength, independent, whatever. So I kind of ignored that part of me. But now, yes, I am Rahaf. Rahaf. Beautiful name. Uh, first Rahaf I know, by the way, it's not a very common name. Uh, Raif is... Baba. Yeah, your father. Mm. Is uh, Raaf is... Um, Hanun is like um, kind, generous, mm. uh, loving, tender. Is that your father? You're describing my father, yes. So I, I know you've told the story a million times, but uh, I'm going to have to ask you uh, to tell it maybe briefly for my uh, listeners so that they get to know you yeah. uh, as the person that you are. Um, I find that for us to be... Uh, solid, successful, um, comfortable, confident humans, uh, we need roots. We need to be able to 
uh, to have anchor points in our life. Uh, mm. And those anchor points, uh, you know, are what, what orients us. We, you know, we, we look at them and we say, we are in a relative positioning to our fathers, to our mothers, to our home, to our yeah. culture, to our position and so on. And it's quite interesting when I uh, look at your story that the common theme of the early years of your life, maybe the first 20, 20 some years, uh, is that loss of orientation. Uh, so I want to I wanna start with them one by one. Home. Uh, you, you grew up here in Dubai. Yes. So I was born in Qatar, uh -huh. raised in Dubai. Until? I think I was 13 or 14 years old. Then I went back to Beirut. Tell me that story. So I was raised here in Dubai. Uh, we were a family of four members, Baba, Mama, me, and my brother. And um, what happened? So when I, when I was 13 years old, before, before I turned 13, everything was fine or normal. Uh, we were at school, we had friends, we would enjoy the weekends, Baba, Mama, all of that. And then we came to learn that my dad went through a financial crisis and that he, we had to move. So that was basically the first turning point of my life. He, um, here in Dubai or the Middle East for a very long time, because people uh, lived as expatriates, if you didn't have a job, you couldn't stay, right? You, you didn't have a work permit, so you had to go back. Was that what happened to you? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I was too young to understand what was going how, how on. How old were you? I was 13. Yeah. But I did not comprehend the the seriousness of the situation. Khalas, we have to go uh, back home and I'm not coming with you. So dad had to go to Saudi Arabia and we went to Beirut. Okay. So from that moment, just one thing led to another. How did that feel before we talk, we talk about the sequence of events? So you, you're, the only thing you're used to is Dubai. Not just that, it wasn't about Dubai as much as it was I have a life that I love. Why are you taking that away from me? Mm. Like, why couldn't you do, do something to fix this? Mm. Um, I had my school, my friends. I was very popular. I was happy. And then from this to going to somewhere that I literally know no one, um, I know nothing about the culture because we also had this cultural shock because I was raised here and Beirut is totally different. And then you go going back to a house out 11, 12 members, which is my mom's family. So no privacy. It, I felt like I was torn mm. in a way where, okay, who am I? Who are those people? Did Beirut ever feel like home? Not really. Not really, no. Because I couldn't resonate with anything about it, even though it's a beautiful place. But for me, it wasn't home. One, I was not welcomed in a way where everything was a struggle, like everything was a struggle. Understanding people was a struggle. Trying to introduce yourself to a group of people was also a struggle because we don't think alike. Mm. Um, the, the nature of living, the lifestyle over there was also a struggle and I had no roots. So I would be constantly jumping from one house to another. Uh, it was too heavy, a, a very he heavy place for me. And most of my traumas were collected over there. So <laughs> so really, it's not the best place for me. Uh, here's home. Here is home. Here is so, home. So, so uh, you know, some people will say, yeah, you know what? At least you had a home. At least you had a family. Uh, you know, it's not that complicated and so on. Let's just maybe continue Break with the down. story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another anchor point would probably be, so your dad went to Saudi. You know, you didn't have Sa that, your dad with you anymore in, uh, you know, at home. And I haven't seen him. I saw him just once after that. So 2001, mm -hmm. we went back. All right. And then in 2005, they got a divorce. Yeah. I saw him once, I think, or twice in between and then never again in person. Yeah. So, so let's talk about your mother as an anchor point. My experience with my mother, I don't want to say a heavy one. It's just an unusual one. And I don't know how to explain it rather than she was very abusive because of her depression. Like she was clinically depressed and I had no idea that that was depression. All I know is my mom hates me. She doesn't love me. Hence, 
she always um, yells, beats me, and all of the uh, normalized Middle Eastern behavior or parenting. But for me, it was 10 times worse because she wasn't happy. So she didn't know how to show love, if that makes sense. Um, I'm not so sure if my brother was treated the same or not because he was her favorite. But with me, it was uh, uh, just a series of everything I do, everything I say was a disappointment and I, it wasn't enough. So she would always make sure to prove her point that you're not enough. Uh, beatings, um, verbal put downs. Um, she once tried to kidnap me. Kidnap you? What does she that mean? She once tried to kidnap me. Yep. What happened was when she asked for a divorce, I was 18 years old, or maybe I just turned 18 years old. And then I was like, freedom. So I decided to um, move out from the house because we were living with her and her family. So it was خلص, too crowded for me. And I was like, bye. So I did move out. It, was, it, it wasn't really easy. I took a house, um, tried to figure things out on my own until one day I receive a phone call from the previous landlord, which I have no idea how until today. Huh? I don't know how that happened. And then uh, we're, like we need the keys or shoe and stuff. I was like, great. Uh, the keys is already submitted. Two, three hours later, I receive a call from my uncle that you did not give back the keys. Da, 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 da. We're going to come and pick them up. I was like, okay. And then she called. She was like, um, tonight is your last night. And I wouldn't be who I am if I don't make sure that you're, you would be kidnapped and killed. Like tonight. That's a mom talking to her daughter. That's a mom talking to her daughter. And my friend was really next to me. And what happened, because I was, I, I literally could not believe that she said that. So you, you get a tongue twist where you just can't talk anymore. Like, what happened? My mom did this and this and that. So what happened was that, okay, great. We're going to go to submit the keys and all of that. But we needed protection. And we wanted to make sure that nothing really happens. And when we went there to give the keys to my uncle, literally they were him and his brother and someone else trying to force me into the car. Hmm. So when he saw that I got my backup, <laughs> he's like, oh, all right. So they, they basically left me alone. Um, and that's just one fracture of what she used to do. She wasn't well, she wasn't balanced and she would love me publicly and hate me privately or abuse me privately, or whatever that word is. But uh, no one would believe that. Come on, she's a lovely person. We all love her. That created so much confusion in my head. Maybe I'm, you know, like, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm really unlovable. Because why else would she treat me like that? I'll, I'll come back so to your mom. That's relationship with mom. Yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, but let, let's, let's build the rest of the picture. So... Your brother is younger or older? He's younger. I'm. He's younger in three years. Mm. Uh, what was that? I'm not sure if it's a. He's an ex drug addict, but I. The last thing I knew about him is that he was a drug addict. He became one at the age of 15. So same age where uh, my parents got a divorce. He was 15. I was 18. Um, and then one day I just receive a call uh, that he accidentally killed someone in my house with an overdose drug injection. And in your house? Was he staying in your house? So he would tell mom that he's staying with me and he would tell me that he's staying with my mom. So we wouldn't, we couldn't know where he's staying. Now we know what happened. So at that point, yes, he was basically staying there. Um, I do remember his friend was over and I do remember that I saw a cold or um, a blue body and I was like, hmm, your friend is cold. Cover him up. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm fine. And on the same day, I received a call. I saw the police in my house, ambulance, and he was so high that he couldn't neither acknowledge what happened or apologize for what happened. But um, 
at that point, we took him back to the uh, police station. He got arrested, and then he got to the retreat center, rehab, rehab center. Rehab center. Uh, I don't know for how many years, but I'm assuming for two or three years, because at that point, I decided to cut everyone off. Like, I literally don't want to be in touch with anyone. And I don't care if you're called family or not, but خلاص, I'm done. Um, and then in 2010, so that's, if I'm not mistaken, couple or few years later, uh, my dad died by suicide. So let's talk about that anchor point. Yeah. What, what was your relationship with your dad like? Oh, Habibi. So he was my best friend. Really, he was my best friend. Yani, you think I, that this is why your mom didn't like you? Because she didn't like she him? She definitely did show some jealousy about that. I, I don't know more. I really don't know. All I know is that I came to a family where I don't feel loved by my mom and super loved and spoiled by my dad. Uh, even my brother, we had a very good relationship until the divorce happened. Um, so my relationship with my dad was very, was very beautiful because at a very young age, he would treat me as a young lady. He would uh, help me read books, uh, introduced me to a beautiful collection of music. He would take me with him to work, to the office. This is that, this is that. And they, he would brag about, like, my daughter's going to be uh, as a su- successful woman. I would share with him my secrets. He would share his secrets with me. So we didn't really have just a father-daughter relationship, which, which I find it very necessary mm. um, and beautiful. But then just... Between 2005 and 2010, those five years, um, last time I saw him in person after the divorce, he was struggling. I did not know about that. And I don't think anyone did because that would be insane if someone knew that he was struggling and did nothing to help or support. We genuinely thought that he was okay uh, until which I just received a phone call that... Allah irhamu. Um, and I did not know that it was suicide until maybe one month or two months later. Uh, I thought it was a heart attack. So that that's basically what happened. Um, in my head, it was maybe it's me as well because Wh- why? You remember, so because of the bond that we had, my Baba and I, is that we never fight or argue, even when we de- we had a disagreement or. We don't share the same opinion. We, w- we would always find a way to have that discussion. Uh, so Baba, tell me, how do you feel about this? What, so we never had an argument until that day before he actually died by suicide. I went crazy and I was like, everything I'm going through is because of you and your stupid decisions, what you did with my mom. Um, I just lost it. So, you, so what, did you meet him? No, no, I called him. It was... Um, it was his sister's birthday. That's why he called. So he called to wish his sister a happy birthday. And I was in a very, very bad place in my life, uh, financially, socially, everything. I wasn't feeling okay. I don't know what he said, but I think it was something like, you have to just be patient. I'll send the money later on, something like this. And I just lost it. I started yelling, blaming. Uh, it was my first time that I yelled at my dad that I don't talk to him with respect. And I just um, disconnect the call and just, I don't care anymore if if things worked out or didn't. And I remember clearly that I went back home thinking to myself like, all right, I think it's time to cut your dad off. I was so angry at that moment. The next morning, uh, we had this habit where if you wanna wish someone a good morning, tamilu mist call. So I did a missed call. It was turned off. Mm. I tried again. It was turned off. And I called my friend. I don't think my dad is okay. She was like, Rahaf, come on. You worry too much. Maybe he just forgot to charge his phone. Three, three hours later, I receive a call that your, Allah irhamu, uh, he died. I've been told it was a heart attack. Um, from that moment on, I don't really remember much details because I I was not, I was so angry. I was so angry at myself, at him. Uh, and I, at, 
even then I did not know that it was depression. I just thought because I pushed him so much to the edge of dying. Uh, so I, that's that, that's Baba. So you have, you disconnected from your home, if you want, by going back to Beirut. Then you disconnected from your home again when you left and hmm. had your own home. Then you, your mothers became very abusive. Uh, your brother became a drug addict. Part of your responsibility was caring for him, but it was, it seemed impossible. Uh, and I didn't know how. Yeah, I mean, you were... Yeah. It was one of my responsibilities, but today I admit I did not take care of him. Mm. I was just busy taking care of myself, you know? So no, I did not take care of him. And then you, uh, you lose your dad and you're, you're thinking to yourself that you were one of the reasons that he left. Not one of the reasons, the reason. You, you, you actually at, thought at, that at, you killed him. At that point, yes. At that point, um, it was me. In my head, because of me, because I was not patient, because I yelled at Baba, because I was disrespectful, because it's me. I pushed him to, to, uh, to die or to have a heart attack. And then when I realized it was a suicide, I was like, it's definitely me. So what happens to a woman in that space? You're now, what, 21? At that But at moment, that time, I was 23. 23. When my Baba died, yes, it, he, I was 23. Uh, so what happens to a woman in that space or what happened to you, to, to me? So to me, it was, um, I lost sense of joy. I lost sense of living. Like what, why, do, why am I here and what am I doing here? Um, everything did not make sense to me anymore. Um, and then what happened is that I adopted a very, opposite kind of lifestyle for me so it's just taking revenge you know that feeling when you just want to take revenge from something or someone but you just don't know what or how so i just went um above and beyond to sabotage myself because i thought that i would it would be a good punishment for me for killing my dad or for causing my dad to 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 so die what, what does that mean so what did you do Nothing. It's just that I quit studying. I I I quit university at that point. I don't want to study anymore. I don't want to take care of myself anymore. Uh, went through very unhealthy coping mechanisms, um, and then I attempted suicide three times. So I was twenty three. Let's say between twenty three and twenty six or twenty seven. I was so determined that I have to die. And I need to make it happen. Thank God you were not good at it. <laughs> I, I'm dead. I'm, until today, Mo, I'm, I'm 35. Until today, every day I say, Alhamdulillah, I'm alive. Because the things that have changed or evolved or whatever, which we can talk about later, but it's such a, for me, for me, it's such a privilege to be alive. Uh, because the, th the third suicide attempt, uh, I went blind for four days and I couldn't see, خلص, I'm done. So at that point I was like, oh my God, you could live. No, I don't want to live a life where I'm blind. I don't want to live a life where I'm just broken or limping or whatever it is. La la la. <laughs> All right. I got the message. I don't know why you still want me to be alive. So I'm talking to my, to God. I don't know why you're just not allowing me to be where you are right now or where Baba is. I have to find it in me. Just give me if it's some time and I'll find it in me to, to find a reason to live. Because right now, all I want is to die, Yanni. Uh, and that was my wake-up call. So I started my therapy, uh, sitting with my pain, sitting with my grief. All right, guys, let's do this. Therapy uh, in the Middle East wasn't quite developed at the time. Nothing was developed. Mm. Yani a girl sitting, uh, living alone was not okay. Let alone uh, a father who's absent or a mom who's always depressed or a brother who's... Everything was so unusual in that area. Me going to therapy just confirmed 
You She's see? crazy. Yeah. She's crazy. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it wasn't really the easiest to go. Even I remember more. It was in um, the clinic was in Hamra Street. Have you been? Yeah, I so, have. Yeah. So Bill Hamra Street, if I see someone just looking at me, entering the building of where the therapist live, I would change, like distract myself, lose a bit of time and then come back. Look, mm -hmm. No one saw me. No one saw me. Um, but but then I was why, like... Why, is, why, why was that? You know, I mean, I when I was younger, in my very early success years at work, and I was definitely depressed and... You know, men don't cry is multiplied by, you and know, man up. Two, uh, yeah, uh, by by two hundred in the Middle East. So men don't even think that crying exists, right? Yeah. And 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 therapy was not an option for anyone. Therapy was not, um, you know, it's it was basically almost admitting that you're crazy. You know, the yeah. the image that you that we had of people who would seek, you know, mental health attention, is that they were mentally Ill. Ill, and so accordingly, they should be in an institution of some sort. But to you, it seems that therapy really revived you, brought you, brought you back to life. It did. How did they do that, or she did do that? Well, it was um, four therapists until four. I found the one. Yes, because you learn throughout the journey is that not every therapist is for you. Uh, the first one, all she did was just with her notebook, listening to me and all of that. I was like, you're not helping. <laughs> yes. uh, so I had to jump from, it's like a uh, therapist hopping. I literally was hopping from one therapist to another until I found one where she was very compassionate and she would hold that space where you just sit there. And at, at that phase, I really needed that. But then gradually she started to teach me how to listen to the voices in my head, not get offended and not get angry and not be impulsive by doing something stupid like killing myself three times. Uh, and then she taught me how to listen to my emotions, to my gut, to release whatever I was um, feeling, uh, grief, compassion, forgiveness. So all of that we had to go through them and it wasn't really... It was extremely painful. So on top of that, she also had to teach me how to sit with that pain and be okay with it and accept it. Um, after I was almost done with her program, I also came across a pro um, another one, which is one year long. That was the workshop that saved my life because it teaches you how not to take those emotions and distract yourself from not feeling them no you have to really feel what you're feeling uh so it was a one-year program and in that workshop i let go of, i don't want to say i let go but i did take off heavy baggage of my shoulders like uh resentment anger the feeling of guilt um C can i ask you to explain this a bit more how how, how do you get over the anger uh you know, to a mother that has treated you that way? In that workshop, it wasn't for my mom. It was mostly about dad. My mom, two years ago or three years ago, and I'm wow. still working on my mother wound. Until today, I still go to a therapist to work on my mother wound. So mother, no, we're not really there yet. I did forgive her, but we're not there yet. It, how do you forgive her? I forgave her when I forgave myself. As cliche as this sounds, but I genuinely learned that forgiveness is not about anyone except you. Because when I'm not forgiving my mom for not loving me, not believing in me, or for the abuse, for whatever she did, I was actually carrying her insecurities, her baggage, her past, her beliefs with me everywhere I go to interviews, friendships, jobs, careers. Now I have my business. Um, I don't want that, you know? And even when you're meeting someone, you always carry that voice with you. Uh, so I was like, no, Anna, I, I deserve to feel lighter. I deserve to feel in peace. 
So only when I learned how to be okay with what you did, not take it personal, like, okay, it's not because I was not lovable. She did not know how to express that love, or maybe she had her own battles. And I came to learn what depression does. Back then, I did not know what it does. I didn't know that, oh my God, depression is the monster. And I wrote once about it, that it, it, it's not my mom who is a monster. It was her depression. And that changed the whole perspective. And I actually felt, I don't want to say I felt felt sorry. It's just I was able to activate my empathy and compassion in a way where it wasn't me and it wasn't her. And I remember I cried my heart out the minute I realized that, oof, I am a lovable person. I am someone to feel loved. It's just that she was not in a place she can express that love or maybe... She loved me in her own way, and I didn't know, or I had expectations. Uh, that was a very, what a, a turning point, a turning minute for me once I realized that, oh, okay. I, I have never heard it this beautifully said, actually. That, you know, they, they say that we only hurt people when we are hurt ourselves. Hmm. So you can you can easily think of an abusive uh, mother or an abusive partner or an annoying boss, you know, as someone who just has insecurities. They have their own sets of egos. They have, you know, uh, their issues. And it's quite interesting when you say, when you had your depression, you started to understand what depression is capable of. Yeah. So, you know, so you can, you can think of the reality that uh, we, we ourselves, when we're stressed, we abuse others. So maybe it's okay and forgivable if others abuse us when they are stressed. But is it really okay? Which no, exactly because... is, is the point. So, so the reason why I say all of this is to say... But it starts with awareness, hmm. Mo. If you're not aware that what you're doing is wrong then nothing's going to change. Yeah, but then but then forgiveness, I mean, in your case, you you don't deal with your mom anymore, right? She passed away actually two years ago or three years ago. All right, so... Um, so so, so I don't have to deal with her anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but so, 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 let, let, so this is a different case. But if someone is in an abusive relationship today, how can they forgive? Or should it's they not forgive? It's for everyone. It's really not for everyone. Yeah, it's very easy for me to say, please try to forgive because it's it makes you feel lighter. It, but forgiveness is for you. The, the minute you change your perspective from I'm forgiving this person, okay, for abusing me for, into I'm forgiving that person as a gift for myself because I deserve to feel peace. Then, very well said. Then you will be able, you, you, you already gave a command to your mind that yo, we're forgiving because we want to feel peace. Help me. Hmm. So everything becomes easier. Like now you said something is that when we are stressed, we abuse others. We snap. We, we. But now, for example, I know a lot of people, including yourself and me, that when we are stressed, we don't. Yeah. We don't anymore. Yeah, like uh, you, okay. you, you, you <laughs> like, like we've been setting up here for the last two and a half, two and hours, half hours. Honestly, two and a half hours. And, and I'm just and, and you know, <laughs> and Raf was just sitting here, like smiling, and then <laughs> just about the minute we were about to start rolling, as actually we started rolling audio and video, and then someone starts to come. <laughs> To walk into to see the apartment next to us. But neither you or I we got stressed. Smiling. We're just smiling yeah, about yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few years back, that wouldn't have been the case. I can imagine. Yeah. So, it is a choice, and a lot of friends hate me when I say that. Like everything is a choice. La have it's not a choice. Yes, it is. I'm not saying it's an easy one. I'm not saying once you make the choice that everything is gonna become magical, but it is a choice. It is a choice to forgive your abuser if you chose to. It is a choice to um, recover from depression, from suicidal thoughts, from anxiety, from self-hatred, from self-sabotage. You can, but you have to make a choice and you have to make the work. Show up for the work. Most of the people do not want to show up for the work. Not Malish. And I showed up. I did the dirty work for more than, I don't know, 13 years until I'm here today, which helps me 
not stress over a lot of things right now. But is it easy more to forgive someone who it to it felt like it was her mission to destroy whatever confidence I had in me or whatever love I had still have in me? That's why I'm always proud to say my heart is still, you know, still um, beats with happiness, love, um, compassion. Um, but I did not feel or receive those three from her, which taught me a beautiful lesson is that, you know the term in Arabic that says, فَاقَ الشَّيْءِ لَا يُعْتِي You can't... Uh, I don't agree. Yeah. I don't so, agree. So let, let me explain this. It's it's the term that basically... It's the term where uh, you, you those who lack... If don't your cup is give. not full, you can't give, right? So is, that, is that what it means? Those who lack don't mm. give. Okay. You can't give something that you lack. That you don't have. Yeah. Okay. Why, why would you disagree with that? I disagree. I disagree. Because sometimes it's the lack or the not having something that encourages you to not... To not let someone to have the same feeling. So, for example, if you're someone who went through hunger, you wouldn't want anyone to feel the same hunger. So your mission gradually or naturally goes into feeding people. In my case, I did not feel the love. I did not feel the compassion. I did not feel the forgiveness. In my household, there was no such thing as forgiveness. Nothing is forgivable. Everything is beatable. Like you would get beaten, but nothing is forgivable. Uh, from her side. So I don't know, I just grew up, I want to feel love, so I would give that love. You know, mm. like I, I didn't know how to, um, I don't know the feeling, so I want to give it to someone else. Like you get to feel it at least. So that's what I meant that when people lack something, they would want to give it to the world. And then at some point, it comes around to you, it goes around, and what goes around comes around. I receive now so much love. Um, and then you learn how to fill your cup and then share it with someone else. Okay, so uh, you, you forgiving your mom is a is an interesting one. Uh, mm. the, I, the idea of saying it wasn't my mom is quite an interesting one. Forgiving yourself. Mm. How did that happen? Did it happen? It did happen. I would be lying if I said it was 100%. It's not 100%. There is still some part of me that still believes that if it wasn't for my phone call with my dad, maybe, maybe he would have either lived longer or would have been still alive. So there's this voice still lives in my head. But how... Um, Again, therapy helped. And when I say therapy helped, means I had to revisit everything that, whether it was a, um, an anchor or a story or a memory or anything from my perspective, I had to reframe it by saying that it wasn't my fault, for example. And that's true. It wasn't my fault. It's, I was a kid. I had needs and those needs were not met. And I was expressing the way I knew back then, that my needs are not being met. Um, do, do you know how many 18-year-olds shout at their dads? Well, I was not one of them. So it wasn't normal for me. I hear that comment a lot. So for me, it, but we didn't do it that way. He had never said no to me. Do you know how many dads say no on a daily basis to their kids? A lot. That's what I hear. But for me, there was no no's in the house. There was, this is what I think, pros and cons. I trust you. You would make the, you know, the best decision. And then I would come back. I hate this approach <laughs> because it's a clear, it, loud no, but he just didn't say it. Yeah, it's the, it's basically accountability on your side. You, you, it, it sort of forces you to make the right decision. Yeah, I still carry it until now. Mm -hmm. So what I was trying to say is that I had to write a new story. Like literally, خلص, you know what? This happened. I don't care about whether it was a fact or not, but let's change the narrative. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't my fault that he was into a depression and I didn't know how to read the symptoms. It wasn't my fault that mom didn't go to therapy or didn't 
get to learn about what generational traumas is because because of her mom she became like that and now she did it to me it wasn't my fault that i didn't know how to take care of my brother i didn't uh, it wasn't my fault that i didn't know what a drug addict feels like or looks like or it wasn't my fault so repeating that to yourself and putting facts into the table to look okay so it it was it really wasn't my fault you learn how to give yourself an injection of love on on a daily basis and that love just expands with time and then one day you would wake up there's no hole in anymore or you have filled it with something beautiful like forgiveness like compassion like saying and admitting to yourself i'm not there yet i haven't forgiven myself 100% but come on rahaf that's much better than 10 years ago or 14 years ago so i i have to say to you that the answer to self love mm-hmm. the answer to self compassion the answer to self forgiveness in my approach to life is who wakes up in the morning and says i'm going to take this wonderful thing that's been handed over to me and I'm going to mess it up. No one does no that. No one does it. No one does that. I think when you say it wasn't my fault. Uh so I I had an incredible experience once. I I dated a woman that has been raped. And uh she, she's still so close to my heart and um and for for a while you know when you're a victim of this horrendous horrendous unforgivable crime something happens in your head that you caused it that you were the reason behind yeah. it and and i there was a moment in our relationship I, i this is on top of my mind because i'm writing about love and romance and so i i mentioned that story in the book um there was a moment we were in singapore i remember vividly we were having breakfast or she looked at me and she said you were right i didn't cause this and the question was so straightforward hmm? the question was did you at any point in time tell yourself i'm going to go out tonight so that i get raped of course not nobody does that right <laughs> did you ever wake up in the morning and say okay i'm going to wake up today and cause my mother to be annoyed did you at any probably the opposite did you at any point in time say i'm going to cause my brother to struggle right the the reality is that some of us for some reason we take the tests that are given to us in life and we look at them as if we're the reason for them not the subject of them if, if you know what i mean mm, of course and i think i think there is an interesting side to it wasn't my fault because no 12 year old child ever decides to leave dubai that she likes and goes back to lebanon she doesn't no 12 no 13 year old child ever decides to upset her mom uh, just because it is you know um the thing that she's desiring most in life it could be disagreements it could be that mom is annoying it could be that mom is restrictive it could be with the mind of a tw- of a 13 year old you you make those choices but it's it's just so interesting how we blame ourselves for things we haven't done we think it's we easier do. is it really it is it's easier of course um if we look at the patterns we do today for example today is a extremely good example because of me for example because of us doing this episode the setup was really a struggle <laughs> would you be able to it say would, that thought now uh, this version of me no but before yes it would have oh it would have been for me like a, a, a heavy burden even last year it would the, have been like the, oh my god because of our episode because of this because of that so i i i ran out of batteries for my audio system because of you because of this episode So which is my me me. Wow. So yes, if we if you didn't do this, he wouldn't been struggling to all of that. It's easier to blame yourself. My manager did this because I wasn't performing right or I wasn't a good enough employee or um anything. I could give you plenty of reasons, but it's easier to blame yourself because it's so hard to hold yourself compassionately in a way where You know what? Things happen. You can't control what other how other people think or decide or behave or whatever it is. 
what do you have in my, what do you have on the table that you can work with? Mm. We don't say that. Yeah, I, so, I find I find it quite difficult actually. I think it's because of my very objective mind. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm very realistic when it comes you to are. yeah. I, I think realistic. <laughs> so so uh, you know, we're in the Middle East, so I think I should probably use quite a few of the rituals and proverbs of the Middle East. So in the Middle East, we have uh, in the Quran actually there is a statement that says God will have mercy on he or she who truly knows their worth, right? Mm -hmm. And so. For for years and years and years, the way is, it was preached in the mosques and communicated by the teachers is that be humble, know your worth, you're nothing, you're not worthy, right? And and I think I was in my thirties when I looked at that and I said, but the statement is accurate, accurately written as he or she who knows their worth. worth. If good, then they know it's good. If bad, then they know it's bad. If if they mess up, then they acknowledge that they messed up. If they haven't, they acknowledge that they haven't, right? And and in a in a very interesting way, you know, God have has mercy or have mercy on here basically means that life will be easier for those who actually just look at the truth. And the truth is no child causes their trauma. Th that's the truth, right? Even if you've been a difficult child, that wasn't a choice that, you know, you're like, okay, by four years old, you sit down and you have a strategy and you go like, <laughs> you plan yeah, it. Yeah, like, I plan, mm. I'm going to be annoying so that they annoy me. You know, it just doesn't work that way. And I think forgiveness, when you think about it, is the wrong term because forgiveness- What would assume, you say then? Forgiveness assumes that you've done something wrong and that you're forgiving yourself. If you haven't forgiving done anything- Forgiving myself? So I have a different perspective. I'm forgiving myself for allowing myself to think that way. I'm That's forgiving a, yeah. myself for losing so many years over the thought that it was my fault. Yeah. So that's where the forgiveness comes. I, I believe that's wonderful. I don't believe that forgiveness in that case is a term that is used as I did something wrong, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. I think the thought should be, I didn't do anything wrong at all. Yeah. You know, I, I, I tried the best that I could with the information I had at the time, with the knowledge and skills I was able to utilize at the time Absolutely. of a 12-year-old. Absolutely. So tell me about your podcast. Yeah, my baby. <laughs> it's, a very, so, it's a very interesting name for a podcast. It is. Don't be a man about it. Don't be a man about it. Don't be a man about it. Okay. Um, is that like a, some kind of a feminist thing? No, no. Your listeners are not, are not going to love this, <laughs> but I am far, far, far from being a feminist. Uh, no. So Don't Be a Man About It is my first baby, and um, it raises awareness on men's mental health. I cover a lot of topics from a man's perspective, like a single dad, a new dad, divorce, how does it look like for men? Uh, anxiety, how does it feel like for men? Suicidal thoughts. Um, I've had people who c tried to attempt suicide uh, multiple times. So they would come to the show and also talk about it. How does depression feel for a man? What are the struggles? What are the obstacles? Anything in life, basically, we cover it from a man's perspective. When I get men to the show and you're gonna come, so it's, it's a man's perspective. One, to show that it's not just about women. And two, to also help men feel a bit relaxed, even if it just was more 1%, 2% of that investment of a man's relaxation where, oh, there's someone else like me. I'm, I'm okay. I'm not alone in this. I'm okay with that. So that's on men who come to the show. The other part of it is I also do my best to host experts to come and speak a man's language. Because sometimes you won't be able to reach, or a man would not be able to resonate with a big topic like this unless you speak his language. So the experts help. And we also try to, try, I don't like that word, do our best to provide tools for them to start taking action because men is all about, let's do this. So we also provide that like, uh, things that they can do to manage their thoughts, to calm their anger, because men are, are 
have tendency to get angry more than women? They, they tend to we act all know on their why. anger. And yeah, of course. Oh, that's you, a good catch. That's a very good catch. I was, also, I agree with you. I think, you know, when you're told that you shouldn't cry, it piles up. Right? It piles up. It really <laughs> like, piles up. Yeah. And there's no place for them to, where do I put that anger or mm. that, that emotion? Because anger is a secondary emotion. You know that. So it's coming from a lot of sad moments, a lot of frustration that I couldn't do anything with except bottle it up. Bottle it up, yeah. So one day it's going to come and not just anger, it's going to become rage. Yeah, it's either anger or rage on one side or you break down, you burn out completely on the other side, right? So if you just keep ignoring the things that are eating you from inside. But you know what, Mo? It's not just men. Yeah, but why, why it's men? It's us. As yeah, of course. Oh, why, why men? Why, why did you choose men? I mean... Because, Mo, I lost my dad to something... Now I see it so stupid, which is he didn't feel safe enough. Not stupid, it's just that if we were culturally educated on how to hold space for men, how to read symptoms, how to open a conversation with your dad about mental health without offending him, without making him feel like, what do you mean? Yeah. Oh my God, I... He would have been alive, probably sitting on that couch, hearing, uh, watching us do this episode on another topic. <laughs> so I do this so no other girl would go through the same pain that I went through. I would, I would do it because men deserve as much attention and love and support and compassion as women. I was eight years old. I don't think anyone knows that. Maybe a few people. I was only eight years old or seven years old when I wrote something like to, to the school like, where is Men Human Rights Institute? Lish Mafi Men Empowerment. It's all about women empowerment. I was that young. And I asked that, like, Baba, why there's no men rights? No. Baba, we are Yeah. Why is there no men rights? We are which means we are... Um, uh, hypocrites. You think? Yeah. You think? No, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Think so. I don't know Lebanese that ah, way. So. <laughs> no, no, no. So it's, it's not hypocrisy. It's just that because we men are the weakest, we don't get enough love or attention or whatever. It all goes to kids and women. Uh, subhanallah. And I grew up to have that as a mission. So that's why why men. And I also believe more that when a man is given the healthy love and support he would also know how to become a better parent, a better husband, a better brother, a better CEO, a better business person. I have worked with so many people, men, who are micromanagers, not because they love to micromanage, because where they came from, they were controlled by their parents. They were not told what trust is, or they were not shown what trust is, respect is, honesty is. So they turned out to be, I want to control in every, control everything. So yeah, if I can help at least one man. So, so what, what are the common themes that you deal with? I mean, control, um, aggression, violence, forcefulness. So you're talking about the struggles a man goes through, not having someone to listen to him. Oh, yeah. I work with men who are married and their wives don't know what's going on. Um, that's the number one struggle. And when I ask them why, either because she doesn't get it, like I tried, but she doesn't really get it, or because I don't have the time, or because, I don't know, it's just not the way we do it at home. Or I'm scared that what would she think of me? I remember there was a man, Ya Haram, he was so scared that his wife's going to change the way she looks at him as a man, as a husband, if he went there and told her that I'm not feeling well or I'm stressed. or So that would be the number one. What would struggle. your advice be to a man in that situation? Then? It's not The advice is not for the man. For the? It's for the woman. And whoever lives with that man, whoever is around him, is educate yourself on how to hold space for a man without making it about you. Not everything revolves around the wife or the kid. Sometimes it's really about the man. Um, so learn how to open a conversation with a man 
how to speak his language, how to hold the space without judgment and without rushing into, you should do this and you should do that. That's what women that, do. <laughs> that was, oh, yeah. a lot of women do that. Mm -hmm. um, let's start simple. Just learn how to hold space for him, uh, how to show support and not make it about you. Yeah, it's not I'm holding the space for you so you can then take care of me. It's not a transactional thing. No, because when you are feeling hormonal, when you are feeling emotional, when you are feeling sad or in pain, he knows how to hold space for you or even he does his best to do that. And you take that for granted. A lot of women take it for granted. Oh, you're going to upset so many women too. I don't care. I'm not here to tap anyone on the shoulder. I'm really here just to, we have a situation and it has been going for many, many, many years. It's time to take some action because at the end of the day, those women who I'm, I'm going to upset, they have sons. If you want your son to grow up as a healthy man and a happy one, start from a young age. Learn how to hold space for him. Learn how to grow him into a man who is in peace with his emotions, how to be okay with crying and not feeling ashamed about it. And he's going to turn out into a chef's so kiss I'll, man. I'll, I, I'll, I'll help you uh, a little upset a few people. So, you know, as a man, I, I one, one of my reasons for writing Finding Love, which I have to say is becoming <laughs> shocking. I mean, you read a bit of it, so it's, it is quite- And I a, love it. You, yes, you say that. I, I think it's a very hyper analytical book on a topic that is normally addressed. It's a deep book. Yeah. So anyway, so, so one of the things that I find quite interesting is that we as men, I mean, one of the most memorable moments in my life uh, was when my daughter, she must have been 24, 23 at the time, uh, where she came to me and looked at me and said, Oh, I get it. And I said, what do you get, baby? She said, I get that you didn't do certain things because you're a man. And that you did other things because you were a man. Oh, wow. Okay. And I was like, what do you mean, baby? And she said, well, you traveled every week, almost every day of every week because you had to work because you wanted to provide for us. I, I religiously spent weekends at home. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't imagine how far I would travel uh, to come back home. Sometimes I would be in California and then drive back, you know, fly back home just to see the kids for the weekend and then go back to California the next week. It was religious for me, but you know, I wasn't home most of the week. I was traveling most of the week. She, she said, you didn't, tell us when you were stressed because you were a man. A man, you know, ho holds himself and, and says, you know, I shouldn't transfer this to my family. I should simply keep it to myself and they have enough pressure and so on and so there forth. Wise, my, my AI is very wise, very, very wise. But it's so interesting how many men go through this, you know, that the idea that a boy, boys don't cry, hmm, uh, that basically being masculine, as you said about your client, means that she will change her view of me if she feels that I'm weak or I'm uh, stressed or I am vulnerable. That needs to change. It's quite an interesting part of humanity, uh, the expectation that uh, is thrown on men to just zip it and keep going. Please don't zip it. Don't be a man about it and don't zip it. So is that what you mean by don't be a man about yeah. it? Don't be a man about it. Be a human. What does that mean? Be a human means connect with your heart, connect with your gut feeling, connect with people around you. Allow yourself to be supported. I know a lot of people, men, women, and I used to be one of them. Now I'm getting better. Is that because we were, we had a tough life or a tough situations, and then we did things on our own, more or less, we build a thick skin. So we think that, Khalas, I'm fine. It's easy. Yeah, it's I, easy. Can yeah, I can handle this. It's okay. It's, a, it's nothing. Yeah, stop doing that. Because then you used a very nice word. Uh, we would be hypocrites. Mm. How dare I tell people, 
ask for help, ask for support, and then I don't do that the yeah. same. Men are by nature, please no one gets upset, by nature are helpers, are saviors, are heroes, are providers, are, oh, you know? so many people will get upset. <laughs> I gave a disclaimer. So, but he doesn't do that for himself and he doesn't give himself the permission. I don't know how else I can Absolutely say that. True. He doesn't give himself the permission to be supported because... Uh, I'm going to say it in Arabic, mm, are you crazy? Like, are you crazy? Of course mm. not. I can, I got this. I got this. Yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> That's one. Second thing is that if you're not giving yourself the permission to be supported or helped or be listened to, or just literally just someone to sit with you in silence, because not everyone will be able to support you, but they can sit with you in that, whatever it is. Two, what message are you sending to your kids or to your young, younger siblings, if you have any, that look up to you that we don't ask for help or you don't deserve to be helped, so you have to do things on your own? If we want things to change, we need to stop thinking from an individual perspective and start thinking collective. So if you are a man and you have a family and you have people looking up to you and you're not allowing yourself to be helped or to even follow your own advice and... um walk the talk then nothing is gonna change really therapy healing uh dealing with your emotions journaling whatever that is is not and should stop being like a solution to a problem let's start doing them from a reversed place and just prevent things from happening but isn't isn't the, isn't the common belief that you know, if, if you're a CEO, you, you're, you, you coach CEOs. If you're a CEO, isn't the common belief that you're the, you're where the buck stops, right? You are, you are the one that's going to solve the problem. You, you're, you're, you can solve the problem by being a human about it and how, saying how can, today, I'm not feeling like my best CEO position. Today, I am feeling like the vulnerable CEO who really just want to talk about his emotions, who is with me. And because you are in a leading position, they're going to follow. You remind me of a time, one of my biggest eye openers, actually. I, so I, when I started at Google, um, emerging markets, I had a massive scope of responsibility. It was really too much for any human. Look at Greece and then Russia and then go from Russia to, uh, uh, you know, po Poland and then from Poland to the Middle East. Every, every one of them had a responsibility, a, a, a challenge that was different and country managers were the key to making everything work. And so I started to develop that habit of snap, 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 move quickly, move quickly. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. And I remember vividly one uh, conversation I had with one of my country managers, let's not mention the name, uh, where he uh, came with his business plan for the year and it was the worst business plan I have ever seen. Like it was really bad. Okay, so, and I didn't, you know, I wasn't harsh or anything, but tw 10 minutes into the conversation, I said, this is really bad. Uh, I need you to go back, review this, and, uh, you know, come back in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about it again. He shows up in a couple of weeks with a presentation, and as he sits down, virtually sits down, um, I'm completely convinced that this is going to be crap. Oh, wow. <laughs> right? Uh, that this is going to be a waste of my time and that he's really not good for the job. So I'm gonna sit for the 30 minutes and then I will, you know, see what I'm gonna do about it. And then I found, I figured that out. Five minutes in, I figured out that I wasn't actually listening to him at all. I was listening to my head. It's so, so hard to imagine you in that. Yeah, like I, was that a, I was a shrewd businessman. I was listening to my head and saying, when will this be over? And then, and there were two other people in the room with me and, you know, four other people on his side. And I said, guys, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm not feeling well at all. And I basically stopped the meeting. I said, I really need five minutes. Would, would you guys, if you don't mind, would you please leave, leave the room, leave me for five minutes. We'll, we'll, we'll close the video conference and call back in five minutes. I asked to remove my following meeting so that we have time. And I just sat down and meditated for five minutes on, I have no impression of that person. I'm gonna look at what he's presenting to me, okay? I shouldn't allow myself. And I promise you, 
I sat back five minutes later, was the best business plan I can imagine. I have ever been presented. In my entire career, I remember that business plan so vividly. It was so solid, it was so to the point, okay? Just by, by allowing myself to see the reality. Hmm? And he was one of my most successful leaders for wow. years and years and years and years. Just because I allowed myself, I, normally the typical fast paced you know, executive I was, I would have said, yeah, just let's run with it. I don't have was five minutes to break. Was that the first time you slowed down? I uh, I started to slow down, really slow down after Google. I mean, I was always a, the happiest manager in the in in the entire company. But pace, pace was. Are you coaching me online? On on. I uh, am. <laughs> 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 and I was like, keep him talking, keep him talking. <laughs> I, I, I was, I, pace was a very, I mean, I don't think normal people uh, who haven't lived my life can imagine the speed that I lived for probably 20 years. I, I constantly had um, not only lots of responsibilities, but I think I had responsibilities that were so quick in decision-making I mean, as I said, with, with Google, I, I had to make a $10 million decision literally every 30 minutes, every 30 minutes. Yeah, and it, it was endless, 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 you know, 20 of those every day or 10 of those every day, you know, it, it was just endless. The pace was so fast. And only I think when I left Google was the time where I decided, you know what? Um, I have the right to actually reduce the number of things that I'm doing. And believe it or not, that was the time or that coincided publicly with what I constantly talk about, which was re-empowering my feminine side, which was the ability to actually sometimes be and not do anything not do. at all. Mm. Yeah. Back to you, Rahaf. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Back to you, Rahaf. So you, ha you, ha you wear that lovely thing that in Arabic says... <laughs> 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 we joke about this. <laughs> what, what does it say in Arabic? Imtinan. Imtinan is gratitude. Yes. How can someone who has suffered so much have gratitude? That's a beautiful structured question. Well, gratitude is my word. Um, and now when I reflect, I realize that I was practicing gratitude without even knowing, you know, in a sense where, I don't know which year was it. I think it was 2006. We had, I witnessed the first war of my life. Uh, it's called Harb Tammuz in Beirut. Harb Tammuz. So that's the war of April. July. A April. Tammuz is July. Yeah. Tammuz yeah. is July. So it's the war of yeah, just, July. Just because everyone because listening doesn't, uh, doesn't understand the yeah. Middle East, uh, the Lebanese people speak such a weird accent. <laughs> we have no idea what they're saying. So Harb Tammuz. I'm Tammuz. teaching him new words as well. <laughs> Harb Tammuz. Um, okay. So yeah. Harb Tammuz. So that was like very shocking for me. Like what's going on? A war. A war. Yeah. How old so, were you? 19. Wow. And you, you were living alone. And I was living alone. It was my first year as a woman living alone. Have no idea what I'm doing. Um, so I remember vividly that that month I only ate um, kaik. So it's like a bread in yeah. the oven and uh, water. Of, yeah. That's wow. it. So for me, that was a grateful moment that I, I'm not sleeping hungry. That it's, Ya wow. Rabbi, alhamdulillah, that I still have this kaik shop at the bottom of the building that I can get kayak from and it's not expensive. It was a khamsmit lira something, which is like nothing. I am so good in looking at the little things. Back then it was because they used to distract me from the big things. So I would distract myself by looking at the window and looking at someone's family, like what are they doing? And if they're happy, I'm so happy. Uh, if they're sad, I would be Allah, I would look at the sky and I love the stars. I love the moon. I, so I learned how to appreciate the small stuff. Now it's literally like, you know me, everything brings me joy. And I make it as a practice and as a habit. Every sunset, like now, I'm going to think and re re um, say out loud three things I'm grateful for. Like this is a must and it re really brings me so much joy. 
And before I sleep or when I wake up in the morning, it really depends. But it's a daily thing. One, if you're happy, it makes you happier. Like I have a jar at home. No one knows that, but I have a jar. And now every, everyone will know that. <laughs> now everyone will know what, what, what I do with that jar. It's called the Happy Ray Ray Jar. And the Happy Ray Ray Jar is that whatever made me smile. I don't care what was it. Anything and anyone who made me smile, I'm going to write it with the date and fold it and put it in that jar. When I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling sad, when I'm feeling That's like I'm not enough. such a beautiful enough, practice. Whatever it is, you know, when I'm just crying my heart out and I don't know why, I'm going to pull a card or a paper and read it. I promise you, you know me. I promise you it brings me the same smile. Mm. I was like, oh, okay. And I smile again. So gratitude is not just something that, yes, practice gratitude. It, no, no, it is a lifestyle. Because if you were calm today, uh, it is because of the gratitude that you practice on a daily basis. Because it becomes something natural. Okay. You remember when you spoke about the traffic example? A beautiful example. Yes, there is traffic. It's so bad. But it also gave me time to listen to a podcast, to listen to an album of Pink Floyd that I didn't have the time to. It gave me time to just sit and really breathe, whatever it is. And for that, I'm grateful. Yeah. Today, I would say I am grateful that my dad ended up dying by suicide wow. because I wouldn't have been able or his death wouldn't have been saving a lot of men today. So to that, I'm grateful. Have you spoken to your dad since? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We have, but it, we haven't spoken for almost a year now. But before that, Baba has the weirdest messages or the weirdest way to send me a message. How does he do that? Habibi. The first time he did it was in 2014, just before I came to Dubai, actually. Uh, and I was at the end of my workshop. So we were preparing for, they used to do, um, there's a ritual where when we end that therap therapeutic experience, you go on stage and you write your own script and you perform it to people. So I had a five minute uh, play or a script and I was actually taking permission. Like I, I, wa I wanted to take permission from my dad. Is it okay if I just go out and tell people what you did? Like, you know, like... Are you okay with that? And that was in 2014. So that's four years of me not talking to him because I was so angry. What I did was someone was performing and I just got the, the instant need of doing this as if you're praying. And I spoke to him. So hi, literally, I was so nervous. Like, okay, we're doing this. Hi, Baba. How are you? I don't know if you're listening or not, but I'm here. I'm doing this workshop. It helps me do, do this and this and that. Yep. Lots of things to, to um, unlayer and work on. However, I have a play that I'm part of and I'm, I'm, I'm putting everything out like you, mom, my ex, my brother, whatever. I'm just going to do that because I, I, I need a new beginning. Oh, and by the way, I miss you and I love you and I'm back. Take care. I raise my head and I see a woman who, who was performing gave four small papers to four different people. She was meant to spell fear, but it was in reverse. So it was Raif. Oh my God. That was his first time that he actually responded to something I've said. And I was like, oh. <gasps> So, and it went on and on. He would talk to me with um, songs, like yeah. Strangers in the Night is his favorite song for Frank Sinatra. And it was the first track that I learned how to play the piano with. So every time he wanted to get my attention, it would be Frank Sinatra. I went to Spain. I saw a big, you know, those big CDs. So I saw a Frank Sinatra then. I put it back. It was, this is my song. I'm here, you're there. It's like, oh my God. So I got it. Um, I did once this tattoo. The year he was born, a heartbeat, and the year he he died. On that day, when I, it was done, and then I and then I took the permission. Like I'm sorry, Baba, but I did this tattoo. <laughs> I swear to you, I felt someone held my hand, 
helped me cross the street. And on that day, someone came. I used to work in events and weddings. So we had an event we were doing. So someone came to me. He was like, are you Rahaf? I was like, yes, I'm the sound engineer. No, you're not. Like, I know who the sound engineer is. He was like, no, Rahaf. Wow, what a beautiful name. Uff. I was like, yeah, but people don't know how to spell it or to pronounce it. It's good. It's not Raif. I was like, excuse me? Like, out of all the names you chose this one? It's like, yeah, because Raf and Raif are so close to each other, no? Mm-hmm. I swear to you. And I was like, um, yeah. And I showed him this. Like, today is my sev- dad's seventh memorial, and I just did that. My name is Raf. His name is Raif. Like, are you kidding me? He just did this. Have a good day. And he went, and then 10 or 15 minutes later, the sound engineer comes in. Are you serious? <laughs> So he does so, things so you, like do, that. Do, do you believe that they are still looking? Oh, absolutely. Every support I received, everything that felt like a universal hug or universal miracle that I'm still here alive, it's Baba. It's Baba. It's like Amal Liwasta upstairs. It's like he yeah, opened the, the doors and he was like, connected. listen, I had to sacrifice my life for this beautiful lady. Help her out. And I swear to you, so many situations. My, my brother's accident... I was sleeping on my friends and I never sleep outside the house. But if I were in that house, I would have been jailed for something else. Um, A lot of situations where I don't know how I was saved, but I'm grateful that I did. I feel it's Baba. Okay, Raha. But now Uh, he's not anymore. I think he knew that I got myself. I don't know. Yeah, that you're that you're okay. Don't I'm need okay him, now. so he's paying attention to others now. To other, oof, I no. love that. Is I that love true? That. I don't know. Um, I don't know. One, one, one short sentence. Biggest secret to happiness? There's no secret. It's it's in you. Just tap into it. Learn how to tap into it. There's no secret to happiness. I think I th- like that answer. We're born happy. Yes. Just stop being unhappy. As simple as that. <laughs> Rahaf, I am very, very grateful for your time. We have been setting up for this for yeah. the last five hours. It's now sunset, so uh, those on video may not see us as clearly as as the it's beginning okay. of the okay. of the podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Uh, it's been. Um, just a small snapshot of the conversations Rahaf and I have when when we meet for coffee. She's a huge coffee fan, a woman who likes Pink Floyd. Uh, so uh, among so many other things, I would say, uh, remember uh, the gratitude jar. Yes. Remember that forgiveness is for you, not for the other. And remember you did nothing wrong. <laughs> I think that's quite an opening, an eye-opening uh, view of life. Uh, remember that when things go uh, wrong, then more wrong, then more wrong, then more wrong, then more wrong, that they will reverse one day, that it's not the end of the world, that one day you will be not the little girl that is struggling with everything that's going against her, but the uh, but the woman who chose that it ends here. A woman that chose who, that it ends here. I love you all for listening. And I hope uh, that you will find your strength to uh, be the potential, to achieve the potential that you truly can achieve, regardless of some of the difficulties that life threw your way. Uh, I hope that you spread the message on slow-mo to those that you love so that they too can learn something that can help them be inspired through life. Remember as you go through every day to find a couple of minutes, regardless of how busy you are today, to slow down. And I will see you next time.